thank you very much for the opportunity to to be uh, with you this, this evening. I, I'm a, an engineer by training. I uh, fell into robotics almost by accident, and I've spent most of my career trying to equip robots with the ability to see. Uh, and seeing is something that we do effortlessly all of the time. We're very visual creatures. Uh, doing vision for robots is much, much harder. So in this talk, what I want to do is just explain a bit about how vision for humans works, a bit about how vision for robots works, contrast the two of them, uh, and then hopefully we can have some, some good conversations at the end. So that's, that's my objective. So when it comes to robots, I think people have got all sorts of different opinions about robots. People think that robots are perhaps going to be the end of humanity. People imagine wonderful uh, robots that can do amazing good for humanity and for the world. And for other people, a robot might just be a very mundane machine that cleans the floor or builds a car or something like that. A lot of what we know about robots uh, comes from fiction. And so perhaps the most famous fictional robots are these two uh, from Star Wars movies. They came into our world in 1977. And uh, they're very competent uh, robots uh, in all sorts of ways. They're competent with language. They're competent in breaking into a Death Star and things like that. And we've seen robots in movies that have got empathy and charm. And so robots have all these sorts of characteristics. And back in the day, in the, in the 1950s, there were robot movies. And back in those days, the robots in the movies was a person inside a metal suit, right? And in 1956, you think that's reasonable. So technology was very primitive in 1956. But the sad thing is that a lot of the robots that we know and love from, from the movies also are people in metal suits. So Anthony Daniels is the actor inside C-3PO for very many of the Star Wars movies. Kenny Baker was the uh, actor inside R R2-D2. Uh, and Rachel Ma was the actor inside the robot in the movie called Robot and Frank. And we've seen over the, over the decades so many different robot movies. Uh, certainly a lot of them came out in, the, in 2015. I think we had two, two, two well-known robot movies came out in that year. And so a lot of what the general population knows or understands about robots comes from these fictional representations of robots. And what we see are robots that are very, very capable. And this fiction is not just movies, it's also books. And Isaac Asimov was a very prolific writer of books about robotics. And he even imagined laws that should govern robots when they're in operation. And in many ways, they're quite sensible laws, but many people think that there are laws of robotics, but no, it's only fiction. Now the word robot itself was coined in fiction. Uh, it was coined a hundred years ago this year in a play by a Czech playwright, uh, Karl Kapek, uh, in a play called Rossum's Universal Robots. And the word robot in the Czech language has got some connotations of slavery or forced labor. Uh, so it has perhaps unpleasant roots. And, and the theme of this, of this play was that human beings were tired of doing manual labor. So they built machines to do the labor for them. And the robots, I guess, understood that they were being exploited and they rose up uh, and they destroyed the humans. And this was a 1921 play. And there are so many movies that have been written on this very theme, but it was first it came in a play 100 years ago. If you think about robots today, they're much more prosaic than the robots that we see in fiction. So on the left, you see robots that are building cars in a Tesla motor car factory in California. And on the right hand side, you see mobile robots in an Amazon fulfillment center. And these robots, the orange robots on the right, move around a warehouse and they pick up shelves full of product and they move it around the warehouse. So it's stacked up in shelves in a warehouse. Robots come in, pick up the shelves and carry them away to people who are going to take products out of those shelves, put them in the box, which gets dispatched to you. So this is the reality of robots today. It's nowhere near as exciting or imaginative as the robots that we see in fiction. And certainly there are some very, very capable robots around now. And many of you might have seen YouTube videos from Boston Dynamics. Some of my favorite ones are here. 
And up in the top right corner, there are some aerial robots doing juggling uh, at ETH, which is a university in Zurich. Now, all these robots are incredibly capable, but they really, they can't see, right? Their ability to see their world is very, very limited and they rely on other ways of understanding what's in their world. And so for human beings, vision is perhaps our most powerful sense. And for humans that uh, have lost the sense of sight or never had the sense of sight, it is a very profound disability. And so we need to think that robots really share that disability. Robots are effectively blind. Uh, it makes it very difficult for them to understand what's in the world. And as a researcher, I'm really interested in redressing that problem. How can we equip robots with the ability to see as well as we see, or perhaps even be able to see better than we see. And if you look at the sorts of industries where robots are common, and I showed before in manufacturing and in logistics in warehouses, robots work well there, but there are so many other industries where people work very effectively in mining, in construction, in agriculture, in healthcare, uh, and much, much small scale manufacturing, but we don't see robots at all. And it's my very strong belief that the reason robots are not in these environments is because they can't see, they don't understand what's around them. And that's something that human workers are doing all the time. They're building a model of what's in the world, looking at other workers, looking at where the material is, planning what to do based on input that comes through their eyes. And robots don't have eyes, they don't have a sense of vision. Therefore, we're not, they're not competent enough to work in these other areas of our economy. And so it's certainly true that computers are very much better than human beings at certain things. So we know human beings are better than, sorry, we know that computers are much better than humans at the game of chess, have been for uh, more than two decades, and they're better than humans at the game of Go and have been for nearly five years now. But there are other things, surprisingly, that, human, that robots are not very good at. And I would argue that this small child can recognize a chess piece and pick it up quite deftly, where a robot, for a robot today, that is still a cutting edge research problem, how to recognize the piece and move in and delicately grasp it, lift it off the board without knocking other things over. So it's kind of surprising that there's a thing that a small child can do much, much better than the best computers and best robots on the planet. And one of the characteristics of human vision that amazes me is our ability to generalize. So I could probably, with my students, we could train a robot to recognize these chess pieces. But then you could put another chessboard in front with differently shaped chess pieces or chess pieces that were shiny or chess pieces that were transparent. And the system that we built would fail utterly. So human beings have a wonderful ability to generalize. And the artificially intelligent systems that we build are currently very, very poor at this generalization. They're very, very brittle or fragile. So if we think about vision, the sense of vision in organisms, the sense of vision is widely spread through, through, through animals. Uh, so a very simple creature like a bee has got a brain that weighs just one gram. It's got about a million neurons. Yet a bee can learn the location of a flower from other bees. They do a dance and the bee learns the location of the flower. It will fly a certain distance at a certain angle with respect to the sun land on the moving flower, gather the nectar and the pollen, and then return to the hive. All of that with a brain that weighs one gram. Now we've got much bigger brains. Our brain weighs one and a half kilograms. We've got 10 to the 11 neurons. Uh, so many orders of magnitude more than the bee has. A third of our brain is dedicated to processing information that comes in through our eyes. So we have a vision engine in our head it weighs 500 grams, one third of our brain dedicated to vision, which says something about how important it is for the survival of, of human beings, that we can afford to devote so much of our body uh, to that uh, one way of sensing the world. So life on planet Earth has been around for about 3 billion years. And for two and a half billion years, life on planet Earth was very boring really single cell organisms moving around, absorbing nutrient uh, from the oceans. And that was it. 
Uh, they use chemical receptors to uh, understand the gradients of chemicals, chem chemicals and nutrients in the ocean, and they could develop some ability to move up uh, a chemical gradient. 540 million years ago, an amazing thing happened. There was a genetic mutation, and this molecule that you see on the right-hand side uh, was adapted in a way that changed it from being a chemical sensor to a light sensor. And inside that became wedged uh, this molecule, uh, cisretinol. And the interesting thing about that cisretinol is when a photon hits it, it twists, it changes shape, and you can see the right-hand side of the molecule flips around. And when it does that, it excites the chemical, the old chemical sensing molecule and sends an impulse uh, up the nerve. And so this random mutation 540 million years ago, changing a chemical sensor to an optical sensor was the beginning of the sense of vision on planet Earth. And it was by complete accident. And today we still have this mutation. It's in every cell in the retina of our eyes and the eyes of every other creature on planet Earth. Now it's quite an, quite an amazing thing to have happened. And it was uh, evolution, uh, evidence suggests that evolution reinvented this thing 40 or 65 times quite independently. It was such a valuable mutation that it gave animals the ability, simple creatures, the ability to understand uh, something about the world based on the way the world reflected light. And then quite quickly, multi-celled organisms came and they had more complicated eyes with more than just one light sensor, with a bunch of light sensors arranged in a concave cup. And that gave them the ability to see not just light and dark, but the direction that light came from. They could start to see shapes and forms and adapt their motion to what it is that they saw. So that allowed them to become either much better predators because they could see prey or for prey creatures, it gave them the ability to see a predator coming and run away or hide. And then by 520 million years ago, we had quite complex creatures like trilobites, they dominated oceans for nearly 300 million years and they had a very early compound eye. And then today, there are 10 different eye designs today on planet Earth and almost all creatures have eyes. The only creatures that don't are the ones that live very deep underground where there is no light. So it's a solution to, to the problems of life uh, that's been widely adopted uh, across all life forms on Earth. If you sort of think of the things that we can do with our sense of vision, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, we can do something simple like thread a needle. Uh, we can do something like driving. And when you think about a driving task, really what we're doing is looking at the road and everything around us. It goes in, into our brain through our eyes. We make some plans and we move our hands and our feet in order to control the car. The jugglers that you see down the bottom are using their eyes to not only see where the objects are that they're juggling, but to predict where those objects will be in the future. Because the, the, the key to successful juggling is not where things are now, it's where they will be in the future. So our sense of a vision is very much coupled with our ability to predict the short-term future. And that has got amazing benefits for the survival of creatures. Uh, so I'm continually amazed at the, the capabilities of the human visual system. Now, humans also used our experience. Uh, so as we, we grow up and we learn about how the world works, uh, we are able to uh, resolve tricks like this. So uh, this video on, on, the, on the right, I'm afraid, is not running. But these sorts of tricks that kind of amuse us, uh, we can use our rational brain to understand what's actually going on, that they're problems of perspective uh, that we've used to trick the eye. We've also know things like on the on the left hand side, we know that those dark marks on the ground, the shadows, we know that they're not a real thing, that we can walk through them, that they won't hurt us. They're just an artifact of light. We know that these converging lines in the middle are actually parallel. And we know that the oval shaped wheel on the right hand side, we know that it's a circle. We just know that if you look at a circle from a particular viewpoint, it looks like an oval. And so we've got deep knowledge in our brains about how images are formed, the relationship between what's in the world and what it is that we, we see through our eyes. We also have an amazing ability to tune out the variation in appearance. So we know without even thinking about it that these are all cups. You know, and they're different shaped cups, different viewpoints, and some are full and some are empty. We just know they're cups. 
but their appearance, when you think about it, are radically different. And these are the sorts of things that are real challenges for robots, taking pictures, analyzing the pictures and trying to understand what's there. The things that I've just shown you that humans do effortlessly, we still struggle to do with robots and artificial intelligence. So here's an example of uh, left to right. These are the same place, but at different times of the day and from a slightly different location. And if we look at this for just a second or two, we can figure that out. Again, very difficult to, to train a robot to do that. And another thing that I think is fascinating about the way humans do vision is that the eyes, our eyes are driven by the highest performing muscles in our bodies. They're capable of amazing speed and acceleration. And so even if we're just sitting still, our eyes are darting all over the world, looking at different things. They're not just taking a picture, our eye is actively moving over the scene. And people have done studies where you put a device on the person's head, a test subject's head, that checks, that tracks where it is that they're looking. And then you can ask people a question. And what's really interesting is the way their eyes move depends on the question that you ask them. So this very famous study, on the left-hand side, we've asked the subject, what are the ages of the people in the picture? And so the person's eyes are looking at the faces of the humans, trying to see if they're sort of wrinkly or, or beardy or whether, they're, whether they look young and fresh-faced. The other picture is, the question was, what's the material circumstances of the family? And so the person's eye, and this is completely unconscious, is checking out the furniture, it's checking out the paintings on the wall, it's looking for jewelry, the quality of the clothing. And this is completely unconscious. Your brain is answering questions by choosing where to look in the world. And this is a trick that robots don't yet do. And I really think that they should. So when you think about what we call seeing, it's very complicated. We use our memory of the world to help us see. We also use our seeing to create memories. We understand the context of what we're looking at. I know that I'm in a room right now. And because I'm in a room, there are some things that I expect to see, some things I don't expect to see. How do I know what context I'm in? I use my sense of vision to establish the context and the context helps me see better. Uh, sometimes I move my head in order to see better. If there's, an ob if there's an obstacle in the way, I move my head to, uh, to, to look around that. So moving helps me see, but seeing also helps me move. It gives me my, a large part of my sense of balance comes, from, comes through my eyes. So over the last 20 years, uh, researchers in AI in a particular field called computer vision have been trying to replicate human visual capability. And they've made great progress. So nowadays, if you've got your photos stored in Google Photos, uh, you can put in a keyword like ships and back will come all the pictures from your photo album about ships. So the Google search engine can make a mapping between the word ships and pictures of ships. We have algorithms now that can take streams of imagery, find all the objects within that imagery and label them. Not 100% accurately, but sufficiently accurately and do it very, very quickly. We have algorithms now that can take a picture and write a caption for it. So what you see, the text underneath each picture is being created by an AI. It's a very concise summary of what's inside the picture. The AI doesn't understand the picture, but it's able to produce some text which accurately depicts what's going on in the picture. AI can uh, infer or imagine the skeletons of human beings, which is useful if you want to try and understand how people are standing with respect to the robot. We can figure the gender and age of people. We can imagine the depth in the scene. So the bottom picture here, things that are bright are close to me and things that are dark are further away. So it's imagining the three-dimensional structure of the world from a strictly two-dimensional picture that we see at the top. In this picture, the bottom image, the pixels are being color coded according to what sort of object they are. So the pink represents ground, blue represents a car, red represents a human being. And so this is very valuable information from a robot because a robot doesn't really care what color something is, a robot cares what the meaning of the thing is. And you know the ground is something you can drive on, that pedestrians are something you cannot drive on, and buildings are something you cannot drive in. So we've created a greater level of meaning about the world uh, through what we call semantic segmentation. Here's an example from some colleagues of mine looking at this problem of how do you match places 
even though they appear to be differently. So we've driven along this road several times, once in the daytime and once at night when it's raining. And we can match our place along the road, even though it looks different, sun's gone down and it's raining, and we can just effortlessly move backwards and forwards in these two video sequences and match them exactly. Here again is some examples of work with shadows that I mentioned earlier. Top pictures, uh, color pictures with shadows, down the bottom is a computer vision algorithm that's removed the shadows. Uh, so they no longer distract us. Here is an example. Oh, sorry, let me go back to that one. This video. I'm sorry that that's not playing, but the, the video on the previous slide was just showing a, a self-driving car moving through the, the streets of San Francisco, uh, demonstrating very, very high levels of performance. Um, what we see here is that the way a lot of these self-driving cars today are visualizing the world is using not cameras, not anything like our eyes. They use other sorts of sensors where they reflect laser beams off everything in the world and create real three-dimensional images of the world directly. But Tesla uh, has gone sort of against the current and they have a lot of cameras in their car. So what you see in the right-hand side of this is the views from the many cameras, from some of the many cameras in the Tesla. And this is sort of how the, the Tesla uh, autopilot is visualizing the world. It's seeing objects, it's putting boxes around them, reasoning about them, where are they now, where will they be in the future, and using that to inform its driving process. Here's an example of a robot that we built uh, at our lab. Uh, this is a robot for weeding. Uh, so it's a large robot for uh, re removing weeds in uh, large scale outdoor agriculture. So this is what the robot sees as it's driving over the ground. It's got cameras looking down and it can detect the difference, can classify individual plants and say, this plant is a weed uh, and this plant is a crop. This is a good plant and this is a bad plant. And once we have that information, then we can selectively spray the, the bad plants using chemicals. Or more interestingly, what we can do is to uh, actually mechanically dig the weed out of the ground. So we can actually use the computer vision system to recognize the weed and then control the mechanical thing to dig the weed out of the ground. A bit like a human farmer would do with a hoe, uh, but now this is all completely automated. This is another robot that we developed in our lab, and this is for harvesting uh, sweet peppers, capsicums, uh, bell peppers. Uh, so the robot is looking at the fruit. There's a camera on the end of the robot. It's taking a few different views. And on the left-hand side, you can see the robot's conception of the scene. Uh, it can recognize the fruit very clearly in that. It figures out the right way to move, to approach it, grabs it, moves in, cuts the stalk, and is, ends up with uh, the, the fruit uh, hanging in its hand. So this is a single-handed cut uh, of the fruit. And humans generally do this using two hands. Our robot's are able to do it with just a single hand. So I know I've gone very quickly and covered a lot of things. Uh, if there's any sort of take home message here, it is that the sense of vision, if you think of it as a technology, a biological technology, it's 540 million years old. And almost all animals have got a really strong reliance on vision. And it's my very firm belief that we can we could create robots that are as effective and capable as humans uh, with just two with just two cameras and the right sort of brain. And so we've got two cameras and a brain and labels to do so many things. We can build robots with two cameras. That's easy. What we don't have yet is the right sort of brain. We don't have the right computing architectures and we don't have the right algorithms running in that brain uh, that give us the power, the versatility, the ability to learn that we have. Uh, but I think within the next 10 years, we will absolutely see that happen. So the challenge for us right now is how to develop those algorithms that will run, create the brain of future visually enabled robots. On the left-hand side, there are some books uh, that I found very enjoyable. I'm an engineer, not a biologist, uh, but I find the biological stuff fascinating. And there are some books that I've enjoyed reading, uh, very, very approachable uh, and absolutely fascinating. I will stop there. Thank you. And I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you so much, um, Professor. That was really interesting. Um, are you able to hear me? Yes, I can. Very well. 
Okay, wonderful. I just wanted to say that the visuals that you used in your entire, uh, entire talk, they were so interesting. And I'm, I'm so glad that we had the opportunity to actually see these videos while you were talking, because we were able to relate with so many things. And I especially like the example of how you started with Google Photos in order to yeah. explain computer vision. And I think it was uh, really beautiful seeing the way the robot was uh, uh, picking out the bell peppers in your farm. That was really fascinating. Um, and I mean, there are a bunch of questions that we've got with very little time right. left. So here Fire away. Go. Yeah, so here it goes. So the first question that we have here is, this person, our attendee has obviously gone through your website. Uh, <laughs> they say, <laughs> could you shed some light on your work in large scale environmental monitoring and agriculture? Sure. So I touched a little bit about on the work we've done in agriculture, and this is uh, yeah, a weeding robot and a fruit picking robot. We've also done work with drones uh, and multispectral cameras to look for things like crop disease and crop yield. Uh, and, you know, there's many people around the world working on, on that because you can cover a lot of ground very quickly from a drone. And with the right sorts of sensors on the, gr on the drone, you can learn a lot about crop health. We've also had projects uh, using all sorts of different vehicles for environmental monitoring. One of my colleagues uh, had a project to count koalas in trees. Now, koalas are very hard animals to see and they don't move very much. But with an infrared camera on a drone, you can see them as little warm things all through the tops of the trees. So it makes them, it reveals them and makes it possible to count them. Uh, we've also done some work on surveying uh, marine mammals. Uh, in, in Queensland, we have these things, we call them dugongs. Uh, sometimes they're known as manatees. Uh, and they're a, a little bit endangered, but from drones, uh, they live in shallow water. So from drones, we can recognize them and count them. Another of my colleagues has been doing work uh, on surveying coral reefs uh, using underwater robots. So, you know, there is, our environment is in such a, in such terrible shape that uh, I think robots provide a very cost-effective way to understand the state of our environment. If you like to bench line it, benchmark it, right? This is the state of the environment now. Are we trending up or are we trending down? Uh, so I think robots have a huge role to play there. Wonderful. I think my favorite bit about these talks are when uh, our researcher is able to explain the exact use of their research in uh, the field. And mm -hmm. you put it so beautifully across. So thank you for answering that question. Okay, so the next question that we have for you here is, if robots cannot see, how can they be used in healthcare? For example, how do we trust surgical robots? That's a good question. The surgical robots that we have today are actually not autonomous. So it isn't that you push the button on the robot and it replaces your knee. Uh, the robots that do surgery right now are teleoperated. So generally it's like in you, there's a camera uh, looking at the surgical site. That camera information is relayed to a human surgeon who is using their surgeon brain to control some joysticks which control a robot doing the surgery. So there's very definitely a human with very good visual capability and fantastic medical skills uh, doing the work. So maybe in sometime in the future, robots have got sufficient vi vi visual skill to be able to do it all by themselves. But I think that's a long way off. Right now we rely on humans. Perfect. So uh, the next question would be, so are robots completely dependent on artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning, or are they, can they, function independently of these uh, fields. So if I got my backup slide here, yeah, to me, the fields of artificial intelligence and robotics are very closely related. So to my mind, a robot is an artificial intelligence with a body. So a lot of artificial intelligence just lives in a computer. So it eats data and it emits data. Everything's virtual. Uh, it's a cyber entity. But when you put the AI into a body so that it can affect the world, it can move within the world, it can pick things up in the move in the world and put them down again, then it's a robot. So this to me is the connect the relationship between AI and, and robotics. All right, definitely. Uh, they are interrelated as you rightly uh, suggested. So mm. um, 
what are the other senses that can be incorporated in robots? So we've been working on uh, vision, but what about touch, taste, smell, listening? How 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 is that research coming along? Uh, there are researchers around the world working on all of those things. Uh, so if you go to a robotics conference, there'll be whole sessions on robot audition. That's its ability to hear. People have done taste and smell. Uh, touch is a very important one for robots because we, as I've talked a lot about using our sense of vision, uh, we also rely a lot on our sense of touch. So when I pick something up with my hand, I use my eyes to guide my hand there. The actual closing and grasping of the object is completely mediated by uh, tactile perception. So tactile perception touch is very important. Then also as roboticists, we create sensors that are beyond, beyond human. So these sensors that bounce laser beams off things, they can measure exact distances. And our eyes are not really capable of measuring exact distance. So I can tell this thing is closer than that thing, but I can't, I, with my eyes, I can't tell you a distance to millimeters. But robots can have laser sensors that can do that. Robots can have radars. Robots can have cameras that can see ultraviolet and infrared, uh, that instead of just three color channels like we have in our eyes, they could have a hundred color channels. So yeah, we can excel on this, uh, beat the sorts of sensors that, that we humans have. Oh, wonderful. That was uh, definitely uh, very encouraging to think about what <laughs> what are the different ways that robots can be in in a way say humanized in the future so okay mm. so the next question that we have here is um so they say can you tell us something about your work in swarm robotics so swarm robotics is not something that i do uh, but it is uh it is an yet another research area in in robotics and it's motivated by the sorts of behaviors that we see in nature. So we see schools of fish and we see flocks of birds uh, and swarms of insects. And generally with this, you get some collective intelligence. You have individual, you have individual entities that are intelligent to a lesser extent, and they can sense each other. But in the way they interact with each other, you get a... a another whole level of behavior beyond the what the individual can do and it's very it's very fascinating and there are certainly a lot of people who who, who work in this and uh but it's not that's not me all right uh no worries uh, so is there any way that robots can help in mining mining as in extraction of resources yeah. or yeah. in laying landmines uh, in extraction of resources. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, in Australia, there's been huge interest in, in robotics for, for the mining industry. Uh, part of the reason for that is that Australia is a high labour cost country. And so if you can have a, a machine that's driven by an AI, if it's effectively a robot, then there are productivity wins. Uh, you, can, you can do the work for a lower cost. And for some mining environments, particularly underground mining, it's very dangerous. So it's one of those occupations where every year, sadly, a number of people will be killed at work in mining. And so, you know, it's a good thing if you put robots underground or in these dangerous situations rather than rather than human beings. If the robot gets crushed, well, you just write it off. Uh, it's not so easy with, with a human. So there is huge interest for the productivity uh, benefit and also for the safety benefit. So the biggest instance of robots uh, in the mining industry is, is trucks. So in big uh, open pit uh, mines in Australia, particularly the iron ore mines in the west of Australia, huge trucks, you know, carrying hundreds of tons of ore, uh, are completely autonomous. They look like a like a truck, like a like a human driven truck, uh, but they are driving. Many of them are driving themselves these days. I did uh, a project. Well, almost two decades ago now on underground vehicles. So they're like smaller trucks that can move through underground mine tunnels, uh, again, uh, to take human beings out of risky environments. So the mining industry is such a big industry. It's got such huge turnover that if you can improve their productivity by say 1%, that translates immediately into hundreds of millions of dollars per year. Uh, so there is a real incentive to uptake that technology into mining industry. 
definitely that's very interesting as you rightly put it's such a uh, it's such an important but such a broad uh, topic i mean the entire industry is so uh, wide there are multiple applications but one has to see how robotics can exactly fit in hmm. and with that i'll come to my next question uh, so the question here is quite interesting so if we are enabling robots to see uh, during daytime how are robots being adapted to see in the dark it's a really good question. Uh, so in the dark, they are essentially just as uh, just as useless as we are. Uh, our eyes are actually remarkably good. If we let our eyes adapt to the dark, you know, it takes a long time. It takes maybe you know 15, 20 minutes to get properly dark adapted, and we have to eat a lot of carrots. But if we do all those things, then we're able to actually perceive almost individual photons. Our eyes are actually extraordinarily sensitive. Now, there are cameras uh, that are available commercially now that are very, very sensitive. So they can, we have cameras in our lab that you can go into a dark room and take a picture with this camera and I can't see anything, but the camera takes a picture. It's not a great picture, it's a bit noisy, but you know, they are, they are, they are happening. Because the, the cheap alternative is you just put headlights on the robot, like we do with a car. Uh, or we can use very sensitive cameras or some mixture of some mixture of both. Yeah, that definitely does answer the question. And OK, so the next question that we have here is. Um, how do we find out if robots are becoming intelligent day by day? And is there a chance that robots will actually take over our lives in the future? Look, it's a really good question. And I have to say, I don't think anybody knows knows the answer. As somebody who's worked with robots for a very long time now, I think I've got a particularly low opinion of what robots can do. And I think all the people in my lab have got a very low opinion of, of what robots can do. And that's really at odds with the opinion that many people in the general public have, because they've been all they know about is what fiction tells them. And so there's this big difference between what general public see and fear versus, you know, at the moment, what we know robots are capable of. So, you know, a roboticist will joke that if there's a robot uprising, all you have to do is shut the door because at the moment robots can't open doors. But, you know, in, <laughs> but that's not always going to be the case. And as computing power continues to improve, as these AI systems continue to learn and the difference about robot learning compared to human learning is when we're born, we know almost nothing. We spend, you know, 20 more years getting to be competent, right? We learn some skills and all sorts of things. We have a useful life and then we die, right? It's very wasteful, actually. The thing with robots is if their intelligence is all in the cloud, right? One robot learns something, every robot's learned that thing. One robot has a surprise, a new experience, potentially. Every robot has that new experience. A robot gets scrapped uh, or dies. Well, its knowledge is not lost. And so what there is potentially is this sort of information ratchet or a knowledge ratchet. It will never go backwards. They will always just get more and more intelligent, which is something biological organisms can never compete. Uh, so I think it is inevitable that they will become smarter than us. Whether they become malign uh, and turn on us, I don't know. Uh, it will depend a lot on, I guess, the people who, who create them and what guidelines are put in place. It is a conversation we're starting to have, but we probably, even in my field of people who do robotics as a profession, I think we could do more. Uh, so we need to be having conversations with the public. We need to be having conversations with ethicists and all sorts of other folk to make sure that we don't create uh, yet another bad, dangerous technology, uh, which you know, we're very good at doing, unfortunately. <laughs> no, that was uh, that was definitely very interesting. I particularly like the point that you made about how uh, robots are portrayed in cinema and media, which mm. sort of makes us uh, assume the worst. And we, we start thinking about the worst case scenario that there's an uprising and robots are taking over our lives. And a yeah. lot of our thinking is, uh, you know, motivated by what we see on the big screen. But um, yeah. you know, that brings me to my next question. This is probably going to be the last two questions that I post to you. So um, the question would be, uh, what is your opinion on the ethical standpoint of AI and robotics? 
and uh, do robotists, uh, do, do researchers in this field have conversations on ethics surrounding AI and robotics every single day? How is that shaping up? It's not, it's sort of related to the previous question. Uh, I think that there is much more that we can do, but we are starting to, to pay attention to this. Uh, it, there is a particular area of robotics that has probably garnered the most attention, and that's what is, is known as lethal autonomous weapon systems. So this is, you could imagine a robot and you program this robot to find a particular person and kill them. It's a bit like a Terminator movie plot. Uh, you know, so these are things that are intelligent and use their intelligence to, to harm humans. So there is a movement uh, action in the United Nations to ban this entire class of weapons, uh, yeah. lethal autonomous weapon systems. Yeah. Uh, there will be some countries that will opt out uh, of, the, of that, uh, but that certainly is a, is a current conversation and probably the one that's, if you like, that, that's most advanced in terms of uh, trying to mitigate the worst things that that robots could do to to humankind, but there are many other. There's the impact on impact on on jobs. There's impact on education. Uh, you know, should we be having our young should young children be taught by robots? Uh, should old people be looked after by robots? Uh, so many, so many questions. What happens to the data that robots gather? Does it all go up into some super robot cloud? Who, who, who's got access and who controls, who sees all that information? Because robots with eyes that are going around, they're seeing everything and recording it. Uh, so we need to put in place protections against against that. So there's a lot of work to a lot of work to do. Rightly said, sir. Uh, very, very important topic that we need to address as we further, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. you know, advance ahead in technology. And I think with that, I would uh, like to ask you the final question uh, that we tend to ask all our researchers and scientists. Um, sir, what do you think is the role of public engagement platforms like India Science Festival in promoting and uh, creating a pathway uh, to bring together science and society. What role does uh, this play in bringing forward credible science to the public? I think it's it's critically important. Uh, I, I enjoy speaking at festivals and I've spoken at film festivals and folk festivals and things like that. I think you reach an audience that is, that, that is interested in engaging uh, or engaged, uh, but I also think that Scientists are not very good at disseminating what they do, to be honest. Uh, you know, and we tend to to, to speak in, in 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 cryptic ways and in code to our peers, and we essentially we are we're funded by 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 society. You know, I'm a, I'm a university academic. My salary comes from the public purse, so I owe it to the public to explain what it is that we're doing. A lot of academics don't like that or they feel uncomfortable doing that, but I think it's a really important role that academics, uh, researchers of all kinds, uh, you know, do. And, and festivals are a way to, to, to encourage that and get us to speak in, what, in ways that are hopefully more accessible or more understandable than you know, the way we would normally speak at, uh, at the conferences that we, that we go to. So I think, I think it's wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor. It was such an honor having you at India Science Festival. Uh, really grateful for the time that you took out to be with us. And thank you for patiently answering all these questions. You are indeed an example of how scientists can take uh, initiatives to engage with society. Thank you so much. It's, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks very much to the audience for their wonderful questions.